This video is about polls and the biases that can make them inaccurate. When an organization like the Pew Research Center conducts a poll to gauge U.S. public opinion on an issue or to find out how people are going to vote, it's not feasible for them to ask every single person in the U.S. Instead, they ask a smaller group of people called a sample. In this terminology, a population is all the individuals or objects of interest, and a sample is all the cases that we have collected data on. In other words, a subset of the population. Statistical inference is the process of using data from a sample to gain information about the population of interest. So here's an example. In 2018, SAMHSA asked 67,691 people in the U.S., people aged 12 and over, if they had ever used marijuana and found that 45.3% of them had. In this example, the sample is the 67,691 people who answered the question, and the population of interest we can infer is probably all people in the U.S. age 12 and over. We want to use the percentage of the sample to make an inference about the percentage of the entire population that use marijuana. But is it fair to do that? When you use a sample to gauge public opinion, you want it to accurately reflect the entire population of interest. But we certainly know from experience, say from political polls, that polls can make inaccurate predictions. There are many ways that a poll can go wrong. One issue can be how you pick your sample. If you pick your sample in a non-random way, then the opinions of the people in your sample may not reflect the opinions of the people in the larger population. For example, suppose you're trying to gauge support for Biden versus Trump before the most recent election. If you just ask the students in your chem class to fill out a survey, since that's convenient for you, or you post a link to a Google form on Facebook and ask your Facebook friends to help you advertise, those samples are probably not going to be representative of the whole U.S. population of voters. There'll be too many young people in your chem class and too many people with the same political views as you have among your Facebook friends. Another way that a poll could possibly grow wrong is just bad luck due to chance variability. Even if you use a random sample that should in theory represent the whole population, you could just happen to have picked too many Trump supporters. If you had happened to pick a different sample, you would have gotten a different result. We'll talk about chance variability later in the class and see that in many ways this is the easiest issue to manage. With a decently large sample, chance variability is, is minimal. Instead, the biggest problems, the main reasons why polls and samples fail to be accurate is due to other forms of bias. So some sources of bias can be question wording, context, inaccurate responses, and non-response bias. It's well known that the wording of questions can affect the responses. For example, when a survey asked, do you think that the US should allow public speeches against democracy, 21% said speeches should be allowed. But when people were asked, do you think that the US should not forbid public speeches against democracy, 39% said speeches should not be forbidden. Similar to question wording, the context of the question can also influence the answers. One famous example is an Ann Landers column that asked readers, if you had to do it over again, would you have children? The request for data contained a letter from a young couple which listed worries about parenting and various reasons not to have kids. This poll suffered from several issues, including that it wasn't a random sample, but more of a voluntary response survey. But in addition, the context of having this letter influenced the answers. Only 30% said yes, they would have children if they had to do it over again. However, when Newsday surveyed a random sample of all U.S. adults, 
and asked them the same question without any additional leading material, a full 91% said yes, they would have children if they did it over again. Even if you're careful about your wording, it can be difficult to get honest and accurate responses, especially about sensitive topics. In one study on U.S. students, 93% of the sample said that they were in the top half of the sample regarding driving skill. From the random sample of people in the U.S. age 12 and over that we mentioned before, and in which 45.3% reported using marijuana, do you think this number is accurate? It seems likely it's an underestimate of the actual number of people who have used marijuana, since some people may not feel comfortable admitting to have used drugs. In practice, even if we make a good survey and trust that people are answering it honestly and accurately, it can be very hard to get full response from everybody that we ask. If only a fraction of the people that we try to survey actually answer our questions, that can lead to bias because the people who answer our questions may be very different from the people who don't. When I was doing mathematical modeling of diseases, I used data from an American Cancer Society survey that asked people to report if self-report if they had lung cancer. But the incidence rates I found based on the survey were much lower than incidence rates based on other measures, such as death records. One reason might be that the people who actually did have lung cancer and received the survey were less likely to mail it back because they were sick and occupied with other things besides filling out surveys. Another example of non-response bias comes from a famous Literary Digest poll in 1936. Literary Digest mailed out 10 million surveys and got 2.4 million returned. Based on the surveys that were returned, they predicted, predicted that the Republican candidate, Landon, would win the presidential election with a full 370 electoral votes, when in reality, he only won eight. One reason their poll got it so wrong was that the people who mailed back the, the surveys were much more likely to be Republican than the people who didn't mail them back. Non-response bias may also have been a reason why polls underestimated the number of votes for Trump in both 2016 and 2020. In this video, we looked at ways that polls can go wrong, focusing especially on forms of bias that can come from question wording, context, inaccurate or less than completely honest responses, and non-response bias.